for Cream and Media's Polity, I'm Lumgile Ngonfe. Joining me today is South African Student Solidarity Foundation for Education Management Committee member, Mzwanele Ndwanti, here to discuss the focal areas of the organization's work. SASFI is a not-for-profit organization advocating for equitable access and success in higher education. Can you tell us how the foundation started and how you view the value of intergenerational dialogue? That's very important. Uh, the SAS fee was started in 2015, 2016. If you'd remember during the wake of Bismarck's fall that had engulfed uh, basically the higher education sector in South Africa. And there were many challenges at the time. And there was this view that we need to have funding and uh, the late dear Homoseneke then called former student leaders and said that we should sort of like try to help the students because it was not only the fees that at the time I was SRC with some of my comrades and colleagues in the SRC uh, that we're struggling with. We're also struggling with accommodation. We're also struggling with food on campus. And then they said that, okay, while the fee issue may perhaps be resolved or rather you may need more government intervention to resolve the, uh, the fee issues, but maybe donors could assist with things such as accommodation as well as food on campus. And then the former student leaders called the current student leaders at the time and said that also in the context of South Africa, where the, the youth has been calling for youth inclusion and participation in the broader uh, policy framework in the country, it probably will do to have an intergenerational dialogue that will sort of assist, learn and relearn some of the things that the past generations have done, the current generation, what it, they are calling for, to make sure that those conversations then are matched and we do not have the break that you often find and things end up falling out of place, but you constantly have this engagement between the different generations. Of course, different generation would also mean that other youth leaders are still on campus or they are their entry-level job, whereas people that were student leaders or youth leaders in the 1980s and 1970s and in the in the 19 in, in the 90s are perhaps now senior in government or in business and that basically helps to bring about that bridge and immediately assist students who are in need without issues on campus erupting out so that long response basically speaks to how SAS we started um, and why we went for an intergenerational dialogue. How does SESFI go about raising money for deserving disadvantaged students? We sort of have uh, people that were invited at the beginning of SESFI. For instance, the SASFI has a management committee and it's got trustees. And then we reached out to all our networks of youth leaders and different leaders in South Africa from government, from business, from not-for-profit organizations, including in higher education. And then we've sort of created that database and would host events uh, now and again and invite the people to continue being donors. So other people make donations once off and other people regularly donate to SASFI on a monthly basis and you can contribute as little as 20 rands a month um, and whatever amount you want to contribute a month you can contribute uh, to SASFI. We then have our active website where people can go to make the donations and we then take the people that are for instance signed up on our database that will also sign up in the website once you try to make donations. And then we keep regular contact with those people to make sure that donor funds continue to come. And we also update the donors on what we do with the funds. How does SASFI intend to change the exclusionary nature of tertiary education in South Africa? This is a very difficult one. Uh, and we've been having a series of conversations with policy uh, makers in this area, particularly. For instance, I think for the past two years, we've been hosting a series of webinars where we were hosting ministerial uh, uh, colleagues, so people in the ministry. Uh, I think the last event we're going to host in April uh, was with the Deputy Minister of Higher Education and Learning, Putim uh, uh, Manamela. And 
Uh, we've also engaged universities uh, on this. Um, we've also engaged uh, business on this. And there's been many people that have actually also been coming to us to talk about some of the possible policy interventions that we can put in place. So, and, and this also speaks to how SASFIT then sort of moved its mandate, not only to be a fundraising organization, but also to be an advocacy organization where we advocate for access to higher education. And that speaks to the idea of increased access um, and also the idea of uh, increased success. So by access, we then always call on the government to increase the funding to meet the current student numbers on campus to make sure that all academically deserving students are not left behind. And for the past three years, for instance, the Ministry of Finance has been cutting spending on higher education. So we have been calling against that to say that cutting of higher education spending is regressing on some of the gains that have been made by uh, NSFAS since the fees must fall to make sure that many academically deserving students have access to higher education. But also it goes beyond, it, it, there's a lot of things, for instance, making another example. You find a situation where maybe students has been um, excluded because and they cannot register for an academic year because they owe fifty thousand. And since we from the donor funds that we have, we often make donations to the SRC campaigns or the different student campaigns that are sort of like calling for students that have been financially excluded. We recently assisted the law students at VETS that were being financially excluded because their curriculum or degree program had changed um, and extended more years in their in, in their academic years and NSFAS could not fund them. And SASP donated in that. So we do take then sometimes some of the donor funds, which primarily we use for student support. So we will big also on students' sub, uh, su success. So support them through food and other needs such as accommodation and, and stationary and transport. But then when you have situations where students cannot pay for certain amounts of fees, then we advocate for that. Because for instance, if you owe 50,000 at VETS, VETS can say that you must pay 15,000 and then you can carry over your debt, but you will be allowed to register. So that helps uh, uh, to say that there are funds like SASFI who can actually maybe be able to help 10, 15 students because then you need maybe to pay only 15,000 to allow those students to register. So different universities should, should then look into how they restructure student debt to enable st for students to, su uh, to succeed because it does not help to say that because a student owes 100,000, but they have passed and maybe they failed one or two module and they cannot register in the following year because they have the 100,000 that they owe, the universities must be able to say, okay, if you can maybe give us 10,000 or give us 20,000, you'll be enabled to, to register and then you can carry the debt. Because it's important that students eventually conclude their studies so that they can contribute to tax and that because students uh, universities continue to financially exclude students it bears more pressure on the fiscus and basically becomes a wasteful expenditure to have supported a student for two three years and then on the last year where the student is likely to graduate you drop them so those are some of the things that we call for um to say that there are many different interventions that can be put in place and we should make sure that we leave no student behind can you detail some of the challenges students typically face and how this affects their abilities to succeed at university? Well, there's many of these uh, challenges, Lumkile. For instance, uh, recently, it has been the issue of uh, NSFAS migrating from what they used to use uh, to pay student stipends into ISAC uh, app, where students are, were expected to load their details into this app and this platform. And students did, many students uh, then tried to migrate into the system, but they were unable to uh, receive their uh, uh, stipends for two months. And that means you have a serious problem of food hunger on campus, which really affects students' ability to focus and can increase their anxiety and pressures and being unable to uh, uh, to focus on their studies. And even that problem is still ongoing with hoping that by the end of August, NSFAS would have been able to resolve all those cases. So challenges at NSFAS where they are unable to assist students uh, quick enough um, really creates a lot of other problems that are unintended, so to speak. 
And maybe to also mention in this part that also NS5 has in the past five years or so, has been having an issue of spontaneously changing their policies on how they fund students, on when they send finances into universities, or uh, uh, the decrease they funding. And there are rules, maybe, for instance, to say there's a rule, for instance, that says N plus one for certain degrees and, and, and stuff like that. So which means a student is allowed to uh, study for the years of the prescribed degree plus an additional year just in case maybe they don't pass. And NSFAS has been just spontaneously, sporadically changing these rules, whereas the students are in the system, and that has been affecting the continuity of students. And this is beside the overcapacity of universities and the inabilities for students to find accommodation, the high cost of, uh, of, un of student accommodation around uh, uh, university campuses, um, this, 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 these are the main challenges. These are the main challenges. You, but you do have other challenges such as like digital divide, you know, where many students don't have access to materials such as laptops or ebooks or data to access some of the material online. And they cannot write their tests uh, sometimes online. Okay, they cannot uh, pay, perhaps access their course material because of the digital device that you find. We also call for challenges such as mental health as being central to student success as well. Um, and student and, and universities have really not created conducive spaces for student success and the support that is required given the different cultural backgrounds that students come from. And you really then find that university is a culture shock and students are unable to set off like thrive in that environment, even though they are academically fit, but this, the, 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 the culture and the, and the, and the environment around them at the universities that not create an enabling environment for them to focus and succeed on their studies. So that's also one of the things that we say that then you notice that a lot of students on campus have got anxiety, they've got procrastination challenges, they've got focusing challenges, some even then commit suicide and some end up in drugs and, and, and alcohol abuse and you have issues of femicide uh, uh, that you find on campus and violence and rape cases that you find on campus. So all the socioeconomic challenges that you would have found in an ordinary South African uh, community, you find those challenges finding expression on campus and universities do not sort of create an environment that is supportive to students' development. So not only academically, but also their social environment. As an organization, SESFI strives to assist academically deserving students with an opportunity to receive a dignified higher education experience. What sort of initiatives has the organization advanced? We really believe uh, uh, um, in, 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 in that we must all have equal access to education, but that education must be of quality. And then that education must be enabling and dignified, which then means that if I come from a rural area in Tonyando or in, in, in Dujua or, 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 or Prebeja, wherever I may come from in some rural area, and I get to campus and I perhaps do not know how to access food or I do not have meals on campus or I cannot take care of my monthly require needs for my uh, sexual health and this uh, and sanitary health this speaks to particularly women uh, students that struggle with those things on campus some of the initiatives that we've done partnering up with vets as well as uh, uh, vets WCCO uh, and as well as the gift of the givers is that on a daily basis we then provide warm meals on campus and sometimes students are able to come and collect the food parcels on campus so that they can cook for themselves at home, but they can always come to a uh, 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 vet sanctuary, which is located by the cricket field. And the students are able to get warm meals. They're in a dignified environment. They can sit as though they're in a dining hall 
or they are in 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 wimpy or, or whatever but basically it's a dignified environment where all students you don't have to go there and prove that you are uh, 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 hungry you don't have to prove that you are poor you don't have to do anything you just get there and just you get a meal like all students it doesn't say anything about the students that go uh, and get meals there and the meals are basically free of charge uh, at the point of access for students. And, and, and that's some of the initiatives that we speak about. Um, at UCT, they implement a, a voucher card where students basically can just collect uh, food vouchers and they can access food at different outlets on campus. So that is just to try and bring dignity into a student's life. And this speaks to campus sovereignty. And campuses also have got a clinic where students can go and access free condoms, free sanitary materials. This sometimes we put at the point of access at their residences so that students are able to at any time access things that affect their public health. You mentioned that there have been certain problems associated with the National Student and Financial Aid Scheme. Can you highlight the ramification this has for students? I think as 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 a, a touched, I mean, um, on on some of these challenges, uh, you have what we call food deprivation or campus insovereignty. And for us, how we view campus sovereignty is that it's all encompassing. So the challenges that uh, you find at NSFAS, the ramifications are startling because some students end up going home. You know, um, the most difficult period of an academic year is probably the first three months, January, February, March, where students have got fee blocks, where students are unable to tell if their names have been approved by NSFAS, where NSFAS is unable to communicate to students whether they've been approved or not, and students are unable to register. It even goes worse to say that students sometimes can register because maybe they don't owe university anything, but they cannot access university accommodation because they don't have upfront fee payments. They cannot access uh, accommodations privately because they don't have an NSFAS letter or an SMS from NSFAS, which means they sometimes then sleep in toilets and libraries um, 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 and sometimes squatter around and find themselves unable to and find themselves in environments where they are unable to even study. And that means that they will not be able to get textbooks. You know, uh, they may not be able to access uh, libraries because they are not sometimes um, uh, registered. This also then means they will be not able to receive the stipends, which means they may not be having food. Um, and medical conditions, I mean, what do you think about students that, for instance, uh, are un and, uh, have got medical uh, uh, conditions that perhaps they need to be taken care of and be in an environment that is going to make sure that their health is not compromised? This also speaks to students that are differently abled. NSFAS needs to make sure that those students who have got some existing conditions and may not be able to sort of like do certain things or live in certain uh, environments are well uh, catered for. Instead, NSFAS only comes back to students late March, April, and stuff like that when university registrations have been closed, you know, and, and, and that affects the students in general. Um, and some of these uh, challenges, I can tell you now, then continue to linger throughout the academic year. Uh, I recently have a cousin of mine who has had to vacate um, university this July because they did not have sustenance on campus and they were unable to continue to live on campus because NSFAS has been giving him a runaround for the whole year. I know another student who's currently squatting with four people in a two bedroom uh, uh, space, which means they can barely be able to study in that environment. So those are the some of the challenges that NSFAS, even not only at the beginning of the year, you will have confronting uh, students throughout the year. And there aren't these year, uh, 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 daily check-ins from NSFAS officials to check how the students are doing. We sort of like at an NSFAS level, it seems as if they just provide uh, uh, financial assistance for fees for certain students and leave students to wander for themselves at these campuses where their lives is basically compromised. What sort of policies should government introduce to alleviate the student debt crisis? That's another big one. Uh, 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 I'm glad you've asked for, for, for that question. Um, 
and we've we've been seeing that we are quite concerned that uh, countries such as the US, the UK, and some European countries who were inspired by us in South Africa when we fight, fought for FISMAS fall have made some legislative changes in terms of student debt. So obviously the primary and perhaps the, the, the highest prize is for us to understand that higher education should be free and it should not be a privilege. That's number one. And then number two, insofar as the student debt as it currently sits at around 16 billion, that there is a student debt forgiveness. And number three, there could be a series of other measures that are put in conjunction with the universities, private sector, as well as government in terms of what you can call debt buying. OK, or rather you can sort of certify that debt and the government can back it up and you can find a private person who says, let's say, for instance, I am Zwanele, I am owing vets 200,000 rands and that I have uh, one year to complete my studies. Or, by the way, maybe some of the students, for instance, that have debt have completed their studies, but maybe are not working, so they are unable to pay back from NSWAS. And what you then do is that you find an employer that's going to employ Mzwanele, and Mzwanele can begin to contribute back to the debt. But a portion of that debt, for instance, if a student has passed, should also be forgiven. And all of these things, we're actually saying that if the government does not intervene into a debt problem, as soon as possible, it is likely to become a fiscal problem. Already 16 billion is a lot of money um, uh, that is owed to student debt. So we need to create frameworks that are going to look at student individual problems and how the debt was accumulated and students falling into certain thresholds that are forgiven and students falling into certain thresholds and given their socioeconomic uh, conditions at the time, you'll see how the student can basically be assisted in alleviating the debt pressures. And this also means that universities must also to stop accumulating large amounts of reserves that must also come into, into party and do student forgiveness as well to sort of alleviate that high, uh, that student debt uh, uh, problem that we have. So sectors that must come together to deal with uh, the student debt challenge. But we have some prototype platforms that we're going to be presenting perhaps later in the year or early next year where we sort of like introduce uh, 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 some of our thinking that we've been developing to say these are some of the things we can do in making sure that we alleviate the pressures of student debt. As an organization, you advocate for curriculum transformation to address the developmental needs of the country and its people. Why is it important to challenge existing knowledge systems? It's important to challenge uh, uh, existing systems, uh, particularly, of course, education systems, as it speaks to the African development and reclaiming um, African intellectuals, particularly maybe for countries in the global south. As we would know that uh, 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 most countries in the global south were colonized by the West, and then were unable to sort of develop further their own thinking and their means and ways and their abilities and their approaches into teaching and learning, as well as research. And of course, we've then been confronted with different challenges as a community, and we've been unable to sort of tackle some of the challenges in the way that sometimes our own intellectual paradigm would have informed us because all the knowledge, all the existing knowledges have been developed in the global north. So it's important then, as was, for instance, as part of the FISMAS fall protest was to call for decolonization, curriculum transformation, as well as the transformation of the academy, to say that our education systems, particularly in South Africa, should not only be internationally competent as well as uh, globally competitive, but also should be responsive to our local challenges and those of the continent. And that is why then the advocacy for curriculum transformation is very important, because we're basically saying that the 
existing knowledges, knowledge production at our universities must be Afrocentric, must be decolonial, and must be critical, and must be able to be applicative to our own lived experiences. And we must be able to then develop it from our own existing intellectuals and understanding our own circumstances. And then once our research, for instance, is informed by decolonial praxis, we are then going to be able to then employ different pedagogies and epistemologies in the teaching and learning processes to make sure that our students are truly African students or our students truly are developed from the global south using uh, uh, knowledges that have been developed at home, uh, uh, applying knowledge that have been developed at home to deal with domestic challenges as well as international challenges. But also maybe another thing that uh, is important to mention is that knowledge production from the global south will not obviously only benefit us um, as the people in the global south, but the international community as well as the uh, contestation of ideas drives. Because what you do not want in a global space is a, is a unilateral sort of view and 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 the one polar world where there is only one master who believes and understands their knowledge and as and, and their ideas to be superior to others but a continuation of contestation of ideas where we all share from knowledge production where one is not disadvantaged by the other and that the best ideas get to see the light of the day. And then you will see that the international community will also benefit from knowledges that have been developed in the South, whether it is in health, whether it is in social policy, whether it is in education itself, or whether it is in engineering or sciences and, and everything else, or the economy and financial markets. We are saying that once you begin to orient our teaching and learning pro, uh, uh, processes to 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 reclaim Africa's intellectuals, you will be able to not only benefit ourselves but also the international community. But also the transformation of the academy is to say universities in South Africa must transform. So not only at a systematic level to change the the colonial systems, but also the race, the gender. The, 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 and other social classes such as people living with different abilities in the LGBTQIA community to say you do not want a university system that is ivory towers, as they would say, but also you have a situation where the 80% of the population uh, in South Africa, for an example, is black and other groups are not represented in the in, in the university system because that is part of the things that create a culture shock for students and at universities and they are unable to thrive. So we're also saying that university transformation and the transformation of the academy will not only be uh, uh, a, a curriculum uh, uh, exercise, but also the profile of universities. That is who teaches, what they teach, and how they teach and why. So that is very important and we must be able to then answer that question. And universities must actually take that process very seriously because for you to truly be a thriving African university, you must be able to respond to these domestic challenges and resolving challenges of inequality, climate crisis, as well as the uh, 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 degradation in our social fabric. So that's what we're really saying that we need to confront so that we're able to really come together and reclaim Africa's intellectuals and reclaim Africa's development and African development be by its own people in the way they see fit and the way they understand and the way they would like to see their prosperity sharing amongst themselves. How can people get involved with SASFI? We want people to get involved with SASFI. Uh, 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 mainly, I mean, we are former student leaders or former stu uh, youth leaders. Um, uh, so we want older generation, but also even current students now. Some students will contact us. Maybe they have challenges or sometimes they want to contribute to make SASFI popular on campus. So you can follow us on our social media pages. We've got a Twitter page. We've got a Facebook page. We've got an Instagram page. We also have got a LinkedIn page. And also we've got a website where you can basically uh, uh, get in touch with us, uh, with us through just the contact us button. And then you'll be able to send an email that will come through to us. Or you can just basically fill in as a donor and we'll be able to get your, 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 your contact details. And you can then get uh, 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 regular updates uh, from us. So you can join us as part of the advocacy 
uh, uh, process. As we have said, we advocate for access and success in higher education, and that speaks to the funding uh, challenges of higher education, which basically says we are calling for increased higher education funding, but also we are calling for the resolution on the student debt. And then success speaks to the student support, where we believe in campus sovereignty, where students do not go hungry on campus, where students have got supporting devices, where their mental health is supported and taken care of, where accommodation is not an issue for students, and where they regularly get uh, stipends so that they have uh, sustenance on campus. And then we're calling for an environment that is conducive and mirrors their, uh, 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 their African origin or any other background and cultural background, religion, religious background and beliefs and different faiths, and also speaks to their own personality identity, uh, identities, whether men, women, racial uh, identities, sexual uh, uh, orientation, and different abilities where students feel represented at institutions of higher learning and through the curriculum that they are taught in class, uh, through who teaches them in class and how they teach them and why. So that is very important to then say that we would like people to advocate that, to to to, to join SASFI and, and support that advocacy work. And people can also join SASFI to assist us on our day-to-day -day work that we do, whether we're approaching funders, whether we're organizing events, uh, 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 we would like people to participate with us if they've got the time. And also people can donate to SASFI so that we're able to continue to support students that are on campus to help them with accommodation problems, we help them with food challenges and other materials that they need on campus. So you can donate as little as 10 rands, 20 rands, however much you have. You can just go onto our website and click and donate. That was SASFI Management Committee member Mzwanele Njwati discussing the focal areas of the organization's work.